So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our event today, Invisible and Unbelieved Meat Endometriosis. Uh, this is going to be a panel discussion hosted by Medical Her Story, and it should run about an hour and a half long. So if you don't know, um, my name is Tori Ford. I'm the founder of Medical Her Story. We're an award-winning international nonprofit led by youth dedicated to eliminating sexism, shame, and stigma from health experiences. So we have an amazing team across 20 universities, seven country, and made up of over 50 volunteers. We're also currently recruiting if you wanna join our team. So we run an online publication. We hold events and workshops to provide medical education, patient advocacy, and undoing stigma. You can check us out at medicalherstory.com and follow us at all of our social media at Medical Her Story. And we even have a new TikTok account. So a little bit more about today. Um, we're going to have a question and answer period after the panel. So if you could save your questions until then, that would be awesome. Um, but you feel free to write them in the chat and just say that you're going to ask again later. Um, we also have a Google Doc, which Yolanda is going to post in the chat for us, where you can share your thoughts throughout the film. There'll be some active note taking, uh, and we can also continue our conversation there after this event ends. Uh, we kindly ask that people just keep themselves muted um, throughout the event, unless they're going to speak in the Q&A. And for accessibility, closed captions can be turned on or off at the bottom of the screen. There's a little button like this that looks like two Cs. Um, so feel free to figure that out. But if you're having any tr trouble, just message Yolanda privately and she can help you sort that out. So we just wanna ensure that today's a safe space for all people living with endo. So we ask that we are respectful of everyone's lived experiences um, and encourage the use of inclusive language. Uh, I'm now gonna pass it over to my amazing co-host uh, to do our land acknowledgement and introduce our amazing, amazing panelists. Thank you so much, Tori. Uh, my name is Yolanda and I'm the events director at Medical Herstory. And I know we're from all over the world today, but many of us are in Montreal, Zhejiang. So I just want to acknowledge that this has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Ghanaian Kahaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Huron-Wendat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabe Nations. And Medical History recognizes and respects the Ghanaian Kahaga as the traditional stewards of this land, as well as recognizes that today this meeting place is home to many different First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. Medical history also strives to be anti-racist and anti-colonial in our mission to combat gender inequity in healthcare. And we cannot begin our discussion today about the treatment and diagnosis of endometriosis without recognizing the role of colonialism and white supremacy in the continued mistreatment and abuse of indigenous women, black women, other people of color, and 2S LGBTQIA plus individuals in the Canadian and American healthcare systems. So I'm so excited to present um, our amazing panelists today. Um, we'll just do a short introduction for each one. So starting with Shannon Cohn, um, Shannon has produced award-winning feature films and television series and is the director of End of What, the film that we streamed yesterday, if you were able to come to that screening. Um, and this documentary was hailed as film of the year by The Guardian. Formerly, Shannon practiced international law and she is a board member of the Oxford Film Festival, All Kings and the foundation board of AAGL, the American Association of Gynecological Lap Laparoscopics. And next up, Lauren Cornegay. Um, she attended Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, where she was diagnosed with endometriosis at the age of 20. She went on to found Endo Black Incorporated, which aims to create a safe atmosphere for those affected by endometriosis and to facilitate opportunities for dialogue on the topic of women's reproductive health for African American women and women of color. And Christina Kasparian. Christina has a PhD from the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University, where she conducted research on brain plasticity and language development. Christina experienced debilitating symptoms of endometriosis for over 16 years. And she has founded an initiative called ALBA, A New Dawn for Women's Health, that shines a light on endometriosis, infertility, and other conditions through stories, art, and resources. And she's also written a book about her story and aims to publish it in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. And Sally Sorrell. Sally was diagnosed with endometriosis after nearly two decades of pain. She went on to design her pelvic physical therapy practice to be a safe haven for people with endometriosis. And she also founded the Endometriosis Summit with Dr. Andrea Vidali, which is the largest endometriosis patient-driven conference in the United States. 
Sally has also lectured worldwide and is currently developing a video vetting system for excision surgeons to standardize excision treatment. And last but certainly not least, Jenna Reich has been a registered nurse for 12 years and is the founder of the Endometriosis Coalition, a nonprofit organization with a mission of spreading awareness of endometriosis. Jenna was diagnosed with endometriosis herself and uses her knowledge to contribute endometriosis, endometriosis content and working as a medical reviewer for Healthline. And she's also currently enrolled in a master's program to complete her master's of science in nursing education. So thank you so much to all of these amazing panelists for being here. We're so excited to have a great discussion today. And just before we get started, I want to do um, a content warning. Um, the topics of discussion today may include sexism, racism, medical violence, and other sensitive topics that relate to endometriosis, pain, and medical trauma. Um, as well, we would like to acknowledge that endometriosis can affect women, trans men, and non-binary people. Our conversation today will focus primarily on cisgender women's experiences, as our panelists will be speaking about their lived experience and not on behalf of the entire endo community. So with all this in mind, please practice self-care and take breaks or log off if you need. And I will hand it over to Tori to start the panel. Um, thank you so much, Yolanda. We have an absolutely stellar lineup today. So I'm really excited for this conversation. I think to start off, I would love if the panelists could just introduce themselves and share a bit about their story um, and how they came to do their work around endometriosis. So uh, just to start off, since we all saw the amazing film Endo What yesterday, uh, Shannon, why don't you start? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. So yes, my name is Shannon Cohn, and uh, I'm a filmmaker, a lawyer, an activist uh, by necessity. <laughs> and um, how did I come into endometriosis? Basically, I was a filmmaker um, for a number of years after being a lawyer and I was focusing, I was based in New York and focusing on building social movements around films, um, nothing related to health necessarily. And I saw the great um, impact that films could make in this space uh, and really moving the needle forward on a lot of different social issues. And I myself have had endometriosis symptoms since I was a teenager and went through the same gamut that I'm sure many of the people who are here with us right now have gone through with many years of, you know, just symptoms that were unexplained by um, medical providers, um, many different misdiagnoses, tests, um, a lot of very expensive procedures that really did not help at all and sometimes were harmful and um, decided a light went off, you know, one day when I thought, well, you know, if there were ever something that um, needed social change and there could be great potential in film doing that, it would be endometriosis because basically the status quo had been the same for decades and nothing was really changing. And I didn't see anything that I thought within the medical, you know, that the healthcare field or with an industry around it, you know, surrounding the healthcare field that was gonna change that anytime soon because everybody was pretty much okay with the way things are. So it seemed like, well, if we could educate and empower patients and unify them, then we could wield tremendous power. So that's where Endo What came in um, with a goal of first just providing an accurate base of knowledge. Um, for those of you who saw it, it's not, you know, it doesn't answer every single question and it's not meant to. It's really just to give you, um, you know, a place to start, to start questioning, you know, maybe the things that you've been told by, you know, maybe people in your family, but also uh, your friends and people in the healthcare field to hopefully give you power to start questioning and find answers for yourself and your own story. Um, and then beyond that, start mobilizing patients um, and people close to them and also our allies to press for social change. So that's what, that's why, that's how I'm here. Amazing. I think, yeah, you said being an activist by necessity and that definitely, I think, resonates a lot. So thank you for that. Um, Christina, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Christina Kasparian. I'm from Montreal. And like many of you, I've had a very long and complex uh, story with endometriosis. My symptoms also started during my teens, but um, Although I started actively seeking care when I was about 16, it took over 16 years 
to be diagnosed with a surgery that I had to travel for. Um, and basically everything that I had encountered up to that point, um, I hadn't really questioned because obviously a doctor patient relationship is um, special. You, you go to a doctor to seek help. So you listen to the doctor's advice. So at the beginning, I really internalized everything and didn't question anything. Um, but then I realized that they were uh, very pro-fertility and pro-pregnancy. And that really started to spur a conflict in me because I really wanted relief and I didn't necessarily want a child. Um, and I think I was just continuously met with a lack of expertise that made it very difficult to find answers to mysterious symptoms that didn't seem related to them, but I knew that they were related. So um, what really surprised me was that even after my diagnosis, so I had a first excision surgery, I realized that even coming back from that um, and trying to, to heal because the surgery, yes, it removes the disease, but I mean, there's so much healing to do after that. My diagnosis was even being questioned. So it's like I had to perpetually start over and keep fighting and I was denied um, physiotherapy and other things. So I, I really felt a voice inside of me go on as well, like Shannon mentioned. And I just reached a point where I thought this is enough. And if not for me, then for other people who are in a similar struggle um, with an invisible incurable illness. So uh, although it was very hard for me to speak up because I was very um, shy, I had my own taboos for a long time. I was in a PhD program, so I didn't wanna show any signs of weakness. Um, I started talking about it with, with my circle and then I founded a project called ALBA, which was meant to bring light uh, to a very dark um, situation. And basically through uh, stories and art and resources, we try to raise awareness and just try to change the culture around these topics and change how they're perceived and diagnosed and, uh, and treated with accurate information. So that's also activism by necessity in my case. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And I think, yeah, it's really touching what you said about bringing light to that dark place. And I hope that's something we can continue to do uh, today. So um, Jenna, why don't you go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna Reish. Um, I have been a registered nurse for a bit over a decade. Um, I'm a bit of a late bloomer in terms of the endo world and that I didn't start having any symptoms of endometriosis until I turned 26 years old. Before that, my periods were completely normal, um, very light, very easy, nothing to write to anybody about. Um, and then at 26, my entire world was completely rocked. And I started showing signs of what I now know was thoracic endometriosis that was invading my diaphragm. Um, so at that point, I was 26. And the first time I'd ever even heard of endometriosis was when it was, was, when it was proposed that I might have it. And this was just based on the constellation of symptoms that had started to develop um, in my 26th year of life. And that started basically two years of just test after test, trial and error of trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. I saw every specialist under the sun um, and no one could come up with why I was feeling so poorly. Mainly my symptoms were shortness of breath, chest pain. Um, so I wasn't the classic presentation for endometriosis, um, but knowing now what I know, um, it, thoracic endometriosis is not as rare as my doctors were trying to make it seem like it was because I did a Google search and assumed that this is what I had based on how I was feeling, but I couldn't convince anyone that this were true. We wanted it to be anything and everything else before we admitted that it could be endometriosis. Um, and so it was, it was years of just trying to find other answers outside of what I, in my gut, already knew was endo. Um, I ended up having a laparoscopy that was unsuccessful and actually misdiagnosed me and said I didn't have endo at all. And then after the fact, my biopsy results came back positive for endo on my diaphragm. And that was my saving grace, because if that hadn't come back, I would have been told that I don't have endo and be on your way. It's something else. Um, so from that point, when I finally had a biopsy confirmed diagnosis, I started seeking care um, elsewhere. I started doing research and found great groups online like Nancy's Nook and found out that I did not know anything about this disease the way that I thought that I did. Um, I found out I was using all the wrong sources, uh, all the literature reviews that I was reading were so outdated. 
And it was just mind blowing to me to learn that. Um, from there, I, I went on to find an endometriosis excision specialist that has a lot of experience in treating thoracic endometriosis. So I traveled from Los Angeles to Atlanta to have surgery. Um, I'm doing really well post-surgery, but coming back from surgery was a whole other fight and trying to convince my health insurance company that that surgery was necessary because according to them, it was not medically necessary. Um, and this was an area that was really frustrating because I, I literally, because I know the healthcare system so well, I made sure I did anything and everything my doctors asked me to do, even if I knew it wasn't right. I took Lupron, I did everything they wanted me to do so that if I went and had this surgery elsewhere, I could say on paper, I failed every single attempt for your treatment of care. I need a higher level of care. And even that didn't work and they still denied my surgery. Um, so I ended up having to file suit against my, my health insurance company to cover my surgery, which thank God I won the suit. But the fact that that even needed to be was just mind blowing to me. And so combined with having such a hard time finding information myself and seeing just all the struggles there were and the barriers to care for endometriosis patients, I wanted to do something about it. And so that is kind of where the endometriosis coalition came to be. And I felt it was important to focus on the two areas that I felt I had the most trouble navigating as a healthcare professional. And that was awareness because there wasn't any, no one I talked to knew about it. I talked to colleagues and they'd look at me like I was crazy whenever I would try to talk to them about endometriosis. Um, it was so downplayed and belittled because it wasn't anything life-threatening. And then as far as the education, that was non-existent as well. You don't know who you can trust, what sources are accurate, what are not, who has influence from outside sources such as pharma. So I just wanted to try to create a space that you knew you could come to, that the information would be accurate, um, that we could raise awareness, promote reliable education, and also empower people with endometriosis to feel like they have the tools to advocate for themselves. And so I guess like Shannon, um, activist, not by choice, but I just felt like everything that I went through, there was no way I could walk away feeling better now, knowing that um, I didn't do something to try to help other people avoid the paths that I had to take. Thank you so much, Jenna, for sharing that. It's such a powerful story to already be starting to get some of those bits and pieces. And I think really interesting, just from the last three um, speakers to hear already some of those diversities and, and symptoms and experiences and all that, but also a lot of similarities. So um, Lauren, if you could continue us, uh, that'd be great. Hello, um, as you said, my name is Lauren Cornegay. I am the founder and executive director of Endo Black Inc. Um, I was diagnosed with endometriosis on March 18, 2011. Um, I did not know that you know, I had endometriosis. I thought that all of the pain that I had endured um, in my teenage years was normal. And my periods, to me, in my mind at the time, they were normal. Um, my mom would break off a Percocet um, and give it to me or put it in, you know, my applesauce because I was in such um, dire pain on the floor, balled up, you know, in a ball in a fetal position. Uh, and to feel that that is normal was one thing that I just could not understand, but that was something that I just had to deal with. Um, I was diagnosed, thankfully, because of an OBGYN in Baltimore, Maryland. While attending um, college, I was um, going through the motions, of course, stress, midterms, homecoming, it was so much uh, going on for me. And I ended up um, having a cycle and my cycle going away. But as I was getting prepared to present in my speech uh, class, my cycle started again. And I was just, you know, taken aback. I was very confused because I never had that happen to me. Um, so I ended up going to the emergency room who told me to find an OBGYN. And this OBGYN, very sweet lady um, who really just took her time, took her time with me and asked me questions. What were my symptoms? How was my period? And that is when she told me that my period was not normal. Um, I, I told her that I had 
you know, pain in my kneecaps before my cycle, pain in my kneecap after, sharp pains in my back, um, chest pains. I went through all of these things. You said, that's, you know, that's not normal. Um, we will need to do a pap smear to see what's going on. And um, I was told after that I had a reverted uterus, which she also stated would be a sign of endometriosis. Now, I ended up having a uh, laparoscopic surgery to diagnose me with endometriosis, and I thought that, that was it. I literally thought that, okay, you know, that's the end of that situation. I can just keep going. I can keep moving. There was no dialogue or discussion about, okay, this is what the next part of your life looks like. This is what you need to look forward to. This is what you should change um, about your cycle. Um, or change about your dietary restrictions, or this is what you should or should not be doing. So with that, I went back to life. And on August of 28, 2011, I was rushed to the hospital because I had a cyst rupture in my abdomen, leaving two gallons of blood in my abdomen. Um, of course, to me, that was the scariest time of my life. And knowing that this could have been managed from my end or from a gynecologist's point of view, then it, it would have been helpful to me. Though I am appreciative of the OBGYN that diagnosed me that took her time, I think that we need to do better with communicating the next steps after being diagnosed with endometriosis. So for me, after that scary uh, situation, I went ahead and I um, started to join support groups, started to do research, started to try to understand what was going well with my body. And when I joined these support groups, I, um, you know, I looked for somebody that looked like me. I wanted to have some type of familiarity um, to be uh represented or to have some type of closeness to other people, but I was unable to locate women of color or African-American women being diagnosed with endometriosis. So even in sharing, you know, my experience with that, I was kind of uh, pushed away when that was happening. Sorry. I was kind of pushed away when that was happening because I was trying to try trying to get an understanding of what it would be like African American or woman of color with endometriosis just to see you know what it is that we do um, and of course Tia Moore and Whoopi Goldberg they both have uh, endometriosis however you know I'm not a celebrity so it's not easy to connect with these people that are so far away from my touch um, and once this happened I just decided to step out on a limb to create Enzo Black Ink because I didn't want anybody to feel like I did when I was going through uh, the motion of trying to locate a woman that looked like me or even women that look like, you know, Native American women or Hispanic women, because I know that it's important for us to have type, some type of representation so that we can feel comfortable. Um, so that was something that I created. Um, I love the platform. This platform has allowed me to connect with women like Jenna um, and Dr. Sally and so many other women where we are all on the same page trying to raise awareness for a bigger cause. Um, so I'm excited and you know, this is just a story, uh, but I know that this is my story and this is very uh, relatable to so many other women out there that I think it's so important for us to continue these dialogues. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I really love the emphasis on community and physicians taking their times and just sort of seeing yourself represented is really important. So um, I'm really excited to get into all of this more, uh, but why don't we wrap up with Sally for introductions um, and then we can have more of a group discussion. Hi, I'm Dr. Sally Sorrell. I am a pelvic physical therapist by trade and now um, the founder and director of the Endometriosis Summit, which I co-own with Dr. Andrea Vidali. And in case I forget to say this at any other time, tickets for this year are now on sale and we're all virtual. So on scholarships are available for anyone that um, really would like one. So I um, was diagnosed very late in life at um, 35 after 23 years of um, really life altering pain and dysfunction. Um, and I um, will mention that my entire family is gynecologists or in medicine. And 
Um, yet I hadn't heard the word endometriosis until about four months before I was diagnosed with endometriosis. I am a firm believer that excision of endometriosis matters and matters a lot. And so when I was diagnosed, I really um, set my feet to the fire to make sure that we not only understood of the role of pelvic floor physical therapy, because I was a pelvic physical therapist and no one in all my training had ever even said endometriosis. So um, now the landscape has changed. I've done a lot of work on that. Um, but also I wanted us to have a conversation about excision because if you're having ablation and then your doctor tells you to go to pelvic PT or go, um, gluten-free, it's really not going to do anything. And things like diet, acupuncture and pelvic PT, they're adjuncts to a whole care picture. Um, I had unfortunately, um, bad surgery too. You know, I didn't just have good surgery. I had, um, an ovary taken for no reason. I was rendered infertile without consent. Um, and we all go through that. Um, I, uh, was unable to have a child through IVF, um, and, um, frustrated that we only talked about, um, uh, endometriosis in like sections, you know, we, we could talk about period pain. We could talk about infertility. We could talk about sometimes my, maybe people will talk about bowel pain, but I wanted people to talk about a holistic picture, meaning pelvic PT diet, the social emotional effects, the trauma from the disease, and then also, um, good surgery, um, and sometimes it's not a matter of endometriosis surgery, but it's a matter of, you know, um, helping with bladder pain, helping with groin pain, which can have nothing to do with endometriosis, but still be um, found in someone with endometriosis. Um, and really frustrated that pharma was controlling the conversation. And we've had some amazing panelists already discuss that. Um, that pharma is controlling the conversation in endometriosis. Dr. Vidali um, put our own money together to um, create the Endometriosis Summit, which became the largest endometriosis conference in the US in just its first two years. And now we're going virtual. So we could host anyone from anywhere in the world. We'll have three days because now this year we wanna to try to train practitioners as well as embrace, embrace that patient and practitioner voice. Um, we believe with the Endometriosis Summit, much like this panel believes, that it's not about the voice of doctors or only about the voice of doctors, but that the patient voice, the person that experiences endometriosis, they're the ones that are going to move endometriosis forward. And so I'm really excited to participate here today because medical history has a similar belief as we do. And it's very wonderful to meet everybody. Amazing. So already so many great uh, points have been brought up around sort of this fragmented approach to, treat, to treating women or menstruators' bodies, the really importance with endo and similar conditions and self-advocacy and maybe not being believed, and this just normalization of pain from uh, female-bodied people. So I'd love if we could talk more about that. Um, my question was that recent reports and from lived experience, we know that the majority of people have never heard of endometriosis. With that said, what are some things that you wish people knew or some of the most common misunderstandings that you face that prevent uh, accurate and comprehensive care? And by the way, Yolanda has been pasting questions in the chat. Uh, so if you forgot what I said or want to sort of reread those, you can have her, um, you can read those too. I'll, I'll start. Um, I would love if people understood that it's not just a painful period. And I don't even want to use the word just because I think even saying that minimizes how painful periods can be. But I feel that there is no um, awareness of the fact that endometriosis is a, a whole body disease that wreaks complete havoc on a person's body. Um, like I had said, it was in my diaphragm. It was affecting my ability to breathe. Like it, it, it doesn't get much more serious than that. I know so many women who have had lung collapses month after month after month. Like that is a medical emergency. And when people hear about endometriosis and they think it's cramps and period pains, there's almost no empathy or compassion for those of us that suffer from it. 
I had to drop out of grad school. I couldn't work. Like my entire life was ruined from this disease. And I think when people hear the word um, and they see on the outside that a lot of us look like able-bodied people, I think I was looked like walking death when I was at my worst. But <laughs> that's, my, that's my personal opinion of what I looked like when I was really sick. But I, I, I don't think people really, really truly understand just how bad this disease is and how devastating it is. And I think understanding that it's more than period pain would help so much in, uh, to me, like, I just don't understand how the entire world isn't outraged about this disease, that it affects this many people and that so many of us are having our entire lives ruined and careers ruined and families ruined and we're not talking more about it. And I think part of that comes from dismissing the fact that it's more than period pain and acting like period and pelvic pain is something we should just live with anyway. You know, there's a comment in the chat that says the person is tired of hearing, just be positive and grateful. It's not worse. And I think I hear that all the time. You can't just be positive and wish deposits of endometriosis in your body away. And I think that that makes it really frustrating. And I remember being undiagnosed. And if they tried me on one more antidepressant and they didn't understand, like I wasn't depressed. First of all, I had chronic pain, which makes you depressed. But second of all, I was sick. And just like Jenna was saying, like, and you have endometriosis everywhere. My stomach didn't hurt because I was depressed. My stomach hurt because I had a bowel obstruction. I had umbilical endometriosis. These, these are real things. And i um, running a practice in pelvic PT. I hear this eight hours a day, eight other five days a week. And it's, it is, it's a crime that um, it's actually why I love Shannon's work because it's a crime that all of us are enduring this. And nobody has any awareness or is doing anything about this outside our community. And then I think the other myth and misconception is, you know, because we get the definition of the disease wrong so much, I don't want to hear just take birth control one more time or have a hysterectomy or it'll go away when you're in menopause because it has nothing to do with any of those things. And it's very frustrating. And I see all of our panelists nodding. And the other thing I think is um, as part of the endometriosis summit, I get to meet so many people and one thing, there are whole communities where they normalize pain because um, we're not getting good care into those communities. And it's really disgusting. Sorry, I get very fired up about this. Um, I, I, would, I would definitely, of course, underline exactly what Sally and Jenna just said, but also kind of like taking a step even further back from the issue and looking at it as a societal issue. And it's just the fact that a lot of people don't even want to talk about periods still. I mean, it's changing a little bit um, because of some really important work by um, younger activists making, you know, uh, normalizing conversations about below the waist issues and in, in women. And um, so that's that's important. But the, the problem is when you go to try to get a diagnosis for endometriosis, you're, you're, yes, you're in pain and you're, you know, you're battling all of these different issues, but the very first one is you're told that it's normal, right? I mean, it's all being normalized or you're told that it's part of being a woman or you're told that, you know, you need to suck it up. I was told that I was trying to get attention at 16, uh, things like that. And then when you get past that, then you're told that it's kind of like icky and nobody wants to talk about it. And that still happens. I mean, that's that's one reason I think we have trouble a lot of times, honestly, getting people outside of our community to talk about this issue and take it up because it's just not, you know, like, ooh, you know, why do I want to talk about periods? Why don't, what's it called, you know? And that's why we called it into what? Because I've heard so many people say like into what? And then you tell them what it is and they're like, periods, no, ooh, no, you know? Um, and that is translated not only just in the, you know, the white in, in society, but also in the medical field. Um, you know, endometriosis just hasn't been taken seriously. Um, it hasn't been, you know, um, focused upon in medical education and continuing education and doctors and professional organizations like ACOG who really don't uh, put an emphasis on, you know, this disease that affects one, at least one in 10 people, one in 10 women. 
Uh, and I say women, you know, as, as uh, to be inclusive, but for this conversation. Um, and so basically, and a lot of that boils down to is it's just not been considered important or people just don't want to think about it. Um, and that kind of has trickled down, this trickle down effect to all of the things that Sally and Jenna just talked about. I, um, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think one other uh, thing that I've encountered is that doctors were even convinced that a diagnosis would not be helpful. That I, I remember having discussions where I had educated myself by looking at resources and I started actually going into doctor's appointments and being like, I think I have endometriosis, can you check? Very clear a path for them to, to pursue. And they always told me, why would you want an invasive surgery? Um, it's not worth it just to have the label of endometriosis. It's not worth it just for you to have an answer. And I think part of it, I mean, you really need to have an answer when you're battling this with your body every single day. And underestimating the effects of this is traumatizing and insulting. That's one aspect. But then I think that Obviously, the diagnosis alone is just the tip of the iceberg. And why would you want to leave disease in your body? It has to be treated. It has to be treated properly. And then once the disease is removed, you have to, your body and mind have to come back together and you have to get your life back. And I think that just delaying that diagnosis with the, the, the idea that it won't serve a patient or that they can just get pregnant and it'll resolve itself alone over time. Uh, or that you'll get used to it, I think it's really damaging uh, in more ways than one, physically with the damage caused to the organs and emotionally, psychologically. I just want to make, briefly make a point on your first point, Christina, is that I was told on camera by the vice, vice president for health policy at ACOG that it did not, she didn't think it mattered when, when that you were diagnosed. She would yeah. treat so if you have the person who is in charge of an organization that educates over 60,000 OBGYNs about your condition saying she doesn't, and we'll say it on camera, <laughs> that she doesn't think a diagnosis is important in endometriosis, what, what do we expect from you know, your local OBGYN? Um, and I, my jaw hit the floor, by the way, when she said that, but, because, Obviously it goes to the treatment, which is what Lauren and Sally are talking about because you're gonna be treated the same because she is, she's gonna treat it the same. She's gonna treat it with hormones regardless. So why does it matter? Because the treatment model itself is broken. Uh, it should matter that you get diagnosed because you should have excision surgery and we should have access to excision surgery. And this is like a whole other thing that we can get into in a minute, but um, it starts there, right? Because all of these, these, these things, the stigma, the taboo, the misinformation leads, trickles down to all of us sitting here today um, in very real ways in our lives, right? And it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, to echo that, Jan and I was told um, that there'd be no point in doing a surgery until I had a lung collapse. And that is just the most mind blowing concept because I can't think of any disease on this planet that we would treat that way where we would say we won't intervene until you get to worst case scenario. Wow, thank you all so much um, for that question. Um, Lauren, did you want to add anything? If not, I think I'll move on to the next one, um, which I think you'd be very uh, well suited to answer. Um, I, I don't. I feel that they have touched on so many points. Um, my point was going to be the pregnancy thing, um, the surgery, the not diagnosing, the birth control, because those happen so common um, to a, a number of women. And I feel like we get that all the time. Like, oh, you're not in enough pain. Oh, your pain is not serious. Oh, pregnancy is what you should have. Um, or let's put you on birth control. Let's solve this with a pill. Let's solve this with medication. Or you're not in enough pain. So all of that goes to with, with everything that everybody on this panel has already said. Um, it's difficult to stress it <laughs> because I feel like we don't stress it enough, but we can only say so much. 
we can only take so much, we can only do so much. And I think that this is a great platform so we can tell people how to advocate for themselves because that that's the number one thing that you can do to talk to your gynecologist or your endospecialist and say, hey, this is not the option for me. So I'm going to get a second opinion. Yeah, for sure. And for anyone listening who maybe is more new to the endo community, just to clarify, sometimes pregnancy is actually recommended as a treatment, which is something I learned at the endo wet screening. Um, but thank you so much, so much for everyone for educating everyone and sharing a lot of your personal experience. I really appreciate that. Um, so we talked a lot a bit about how sort of these stereotypes around womanhood are really prevalent and about what pain you should uh, be enduring or expect to endure the taboos and ickiness around menstruation. So I'd love to speak more on that. Um, and if we could maybe also bring in, how do you think other factors like race, class, sexuality, or not being cisgender may also affect this journey? So Lauren, I know you do a lot of work around racialized women in the Black community. So maybe you want to start us off there with why that intersectional approach is so important. Yes, um, that is so important because unfortunately, African-American women and women of color um, are not able to get the diagnosis in a, uh, a good amount of time. And to be honest, endometriosis, it takes years to diagnose originally. So being mm -hmm. African-American or a woman of color, you're put at a disproportional rate than um, white women or Caucasian women because depending on the resources in their area, um, depending on the health equity, we already know that there is a huge health equity going on in the medical industry, um, dating back to J. Marion Sims, who is listed as the modern day gynecology um, father. Um, even looking at that type of stuff and the history behind that, we will see that um, a lot of times African-American women and women of color uh, unfortunately are looked at as if we can manage pain um, differently. Um, there has been studies and surveys and research that dates back and shows um, statistics where medical professionals have actually stated that they feel that African Americans can handle pain or deal with pain um, better or more than what anybody else can. Um, whether, whether or not that's true or not, I don't think that it's okay to say, okay, well, because you can handle pain, let, let me allow you to be in more pain while other women get the, the care and the treatment versus, hey, I know you can deal with more pain, but I don't want to see you in any pain. So let's get you the help that you deserve and the help that you need. Um, you can also get an opportunity to take a look at all of the experiments, unfortunately, that have happened within the medical industry with the syphilis um, Tuskegee experiment. You can look into Henrietta Lacks, who is um, a wonderful story about uh, the life of Henrietta Lacks. Oprah Winfrey actually um, portrayed her in a movie and there was a book put out by Rebecca Skolt who actually um, wrote the book in reference to him, Rada Lax. The family lives right in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, she actually has a cell named after her, which is called Gila Cells. Um, and unfortunately, because of her uh, cells and what she, or I guess her body and her experiment of her body, she was able to, or the doctors were able to um, create medicine for so many people that for the medicines that we actually take right now. So I want everybody to get an opportunity to look into those things. Um, a lot of times we have situations and it, it is systematic racism, unfortunately, when you look at um, the health system and you look at the lack of resources in predominantly African-American communities, you will see that there are not hospitals that are afforded certain things so that they can get the care that they need. Or you can look into the fact that there are um, food deserts in African-American or predominantly African-American communities. And in order for us to continuously educate um, people that are African-American women of color uh, or people of color about how to manage their endometriosis. We talk about getting access to certain foods. So if you can't have access to certain foods because you're in a food desert, well, that's way more difficult um, and that causes a, a rift already. Um, so there are so many things that we can discuss when it comes to systematic racism and the lack of resources for African-American um, people when it comes to the endometriosis community, as well as when it comes to other um, health disparities as well. 
So those are just a few things. I've had my own share of difficulties um, and it, it has ha happened. It doesn't really necessarily matter if your doctor is white or black. I do think it's more important that your doctor cares about your pain. I know that we tend to say, oh, I want to get an African-American doctor. I want to get a Hispanic doctor. But if that African-American or Hispanic doctor was taught and believes the same thing that J. Marion Sims believed, then that just cancels out what we need. So I think it's important important to find a doctor that you can communicate with first, that listens to your concerns, um, that does not gaslight you, and also is open um, to the possibility of allowing you to um, speak about what is going on with your body as an African American or a woman of color. I'd love to speak on it from a class perspective. Um, this disease is insanely expensive to treat. And I think that that's a disparity that we don't talk enough about, that access to good care is expensive and it's unrealistic to so many people. Um, I know I count myself insanely privileged and blessed to have been able to access really great care, um, but that was not without sacrifice from multiple people in my family to make it happen. It was not easy and it still is not. Um, the amount of money that I pay, even now for the aftermath, of the things I still have to treat from having endo for so long. I don't think that there's a year that I spend less than $30,000 a year on healthcare expenses between medications and therapies that are not covered and so on and so forth. And so, yes, we can get a diagnosis, but then to even be able to access the care that will actually make a difference in our quality of life is almost unrealistic. And we're making decisions where we're choosing between having a family or taking care of our health or buying a home or taking care of our health or sending our kids to college or taking care of our health. And that is criminal to me, but that is a choice that so many people are being forced to make. Um, and until we, we get to a place where we're being honest with ourselves that our medical system is not set up for us to thrive with this disease, um, we're not gonna get anywhere because even if we do make diagnosis shorter, without being able to actually access the care that's going to help, what are we even doing? Yep, and the, and the answer to, to add to Jenna's point, which is so true, and it's something that we delve into in the next film and will be a lot of my attention in, in the next year or two to come, and at least is to get that access. Um, and what I've learned is a lot of the barriers put up are political. And, and I'm not talking about Republican or Democrat, I'm just talking about um, political in the sense of getting medical institutions to move and to feel fire that they need to be moving and making um, decisions that really do benefit the women and not just paying lip service. So they you know, put their logo behind this initiative or that initiative that's really driven by pharma to make them look good when we need to be pressuring them together to make substantive changes in policy um, and getting a CPT code for excision surgery, for example, so that women can have access to the, the best care that we have at the moment, at least. I'm not saying it's always gonna be the best, but that all women have access to the best treatment possible at the moment. Um, and then also, and that's something that Sally can speak to, are all of these ancillary treatments that are important too, like physical therapy. Um, like, I mean, things like acupuncture, things like, you know, nutritionist. Um, I had excision surgery, which I would say was successful um, 11 years ago was my last surgery. But I was very fortunate that at the time it was covered by insurance or I wouldn't have been able to have it. I was a grad student. I mean, and that's, that's the reality. Today, I probably couldn't have, you know, had it in that, in that situation. And the fact that there are financial barriers to care that relegate women to subpar treatment is criminal. And the only way that's gonna change is if all of us come together, like Sally's, you know, the one voice, and it's true, and pressure the people in power that are able to make changes. They can, we just have to make them. That's basically the bottom line. But looking at both sides of the curtain, you know, behind the curtain, and then here we are in front of it, that's all that has to happen. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, Christina, Sally, do you want to comment on that? If not, I think I'll move on to our next question, but really appreciate um, everything everyone's been saying. And I'm really happy we were able to bring 
attention to a lot of these issues and all sort of the things Lauren mentioned to check out his resources. We'll make sure those are included in the Google Doc so you can learn more about those um, racial disparities and violence against women of color. Um, but yeah, so Sally, Lauren. I think the long wait time or the delay in diagnosis um, really is part of why people may need so much aftercare. So mm -hmm. if you're being diagnosed as, I love how everybody is nodding on our panel. So if you're diagnosed early and somebody hears your pain early, then you're likely not going to get an upright related central nervous system, which means the pain is recognized by your brain. You're likely not going to get um, an immune response to the inflammation in your system and get food allergies. You're likely not going to get pelvic floor dysfunction. And maybe if you were heard the first time or heard at least the within the first year, you're not going to have um, the psychological effects from the trauma and the PTSD of living with this disease. So um, I definitely think the delay in diagnosis is an issue. Um, I also believe uh, a, a lot of what Shannon said is very true that if we mobilized together it comes from the top. So if the president of ACOG is saying your diagnosis doesn't matter or this particular treatment doesn't matter, we're gonna treat with hormones anyway, then it's very hard for us to chip away as a endometriosis community and change it for our own community. So in my opinion, then it just takes more of us. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, we heard Lauren tell her story very bravely that her mother used to crumble up a little bit of Percocet. Now, um, I'm older, so we used to be able to get drugs like that when we needed them. Now, because of the opioid crisis, the younger generation that isn't being diagnosed, they're not able to get anything. And so they're suffering longer and longer, and it makes that need to diagnose earlier and diagnose better even more important because what, if one more person, did you try meditation? Like meditation, you can't meditate your way out of an adenomyoma. So I think, or did you, you know, did you um, go, maybe don't have any dairy. I don't think dairy is going to take the endometriosis off of your bowel. So I, I just think it's, it's um, that delay in diagnosis and it has to be a societal change, you know. Um, Dr. Gargiulo talks about that where we are in endometriosis now is very much where people were with breast cancer in the uh, late 70s and 80s, except that because you died of breast cancer, breast cancer moved forward. So with endometriosis, we don't die, but we feel like we would like to because it's that kind of pain. And so we're seeing we have some momentum, but we have to have legislative change and we have to have change um, in our medical society to move forward. And I really believe it's gonna take our voices to do that. Definitely. So my next question, which I will give to Christina first, um, is that in addition to being members of the endometriosis community, all of our panelists are actually founders of patient advocacy groups. Um, so I would love to hear more about what role you think these groups can play in fighting for better health care uh, for menstruators and women from your own experiences. Um, yeah, I think patient uh, driven groups are extremely important because of our collective voice. And I remember realizing for the first time how many haunting commonalities there are in our stories um, around the world. And that really struck me because initially, I mean, you often feel as though you're a dissatisfied patient who's complaining about not receiving adequate care. But if there are so many voices around the world that are kind of, that have the same messaging, I think that that definitely speaks to a broken system that needs to change. And um, so I think that there's really, um, all of these groups are, are really important to um, raise awareness, not only in society, but also within the medical field and to collaborate with 
uh, researchers and clinicians to really drive that change and to identify the gaps and the shortcomings of the system um, and really change the way the conditions are even perceived and then really work hard to, to change the way that they're diagnosed and treated um, and move away from this idea that pain is secondary and that pain doesn't deserve attention and really move towards seeing endometriosis as a whole body issue and an emotional, um, an issue that has a, a tremendous emotional impact and really impacts our lives, every facet of our lives. So I think the groups are really pivotal to create change in a unified way and in a way that is collaborative and multidisciplinary. Um. I would like to share, uh, I think that Dr. Sally made a really good point earlier and Christina make a really great point. It's so important for all of us to work together um, because there are, there are companies and businesses that work together frequently. As a nonprofit or as some um, groups, we have to work together to actually allow all of our demographics to be represented, you know, and at the end of the day, when you come together, our voices are louder together than separate. And there's been um, some, you know, interesting things that has transpired in 2020. But I think uh, initially, we've all come closer, we've connected with each other some type of way, um, to the point where we're having these conversations more often, we're talking about what we need to do, we're talking about how we can make change. Um, and making change isn't just about talking about it, but it's also about um, looking at laws and regulations and policies, and talking to doctors and making these decisions. Um, I'll use an example, I won't share the clinic name, but there was an endometriosis clinic that did post um, or had their uh, symptoms of endometriosis referred um, to risk factors as tall, uh, of white race, um, brunette and blonde hair. And as you see, all of us look totally different <laughs> on this panel. And uh, it got to a point where someone else saw that. I didn't see it, but the person that saw it was very, very hurt because she was looking for an endometriosis specialist. She wanted to get changed. She wanted some relief and she felt so offended that she reached out to Endo Black to make a statement about it. So, you know, we shared it and we had Jenna who supported it. We had Dr. Sally who supported it. So, you know, and I believe Endo What supported it as well. So there's so many different uh, aspects of supporting each other and working together to make change happen, even though that for me, that was a big moment, but that may look so little to some other people. But if we continue to do support like that, if we continue to work together, um, and it doesn't have to be on a front where we're all in one organization, we can do our own work together and then bring it together to make sure that we are getting the answers that we need. Um, and I think that sometimes we work amazing separately because I'm not as equipped as Dr. Sally. Dr. Sally is a doctor. Um, that is her, her superpower right there. So she's able to tap into certain things that I'm not able to tap into, but that allows her to know so much more information than I do. Jenna is working in the medical industry. She has been able to tap into so much. So there's certain things that I'm not great at that other women on this platform are great at. And with that, we're able to connect each other, tap in and support each other so that we're able to make some type of um, change in the near future. And I'm so excited because even policies, regulations, and um, laws are going to be changed. And um, how we talk to doctors, the questions, um, what we should and shouldn't be doing, all of these things, all of these platforms allows us to tap into certain demographics and certain um, areas. That way we can bring them together in the future. I agree with everything uh, that Lauren just said. Um, I also think that our collective groups give a voice to our community as a whole, a trustworthy voice, which is so important. I think that we've all had reputations where our community feels like we are in on their, on their side, in their corner and have their best interest at heart. And so not everybody wants to stand up and, and fight big pharma. Not everybody wants to take it to a personal clinic and get them to take something down. Not everyone feels comfortable to do these things. And I think our groups 
give a sense of, I think like, oh, someone's doing it. Like, even if I don't feel like I can, like I, I trust that there are people who are doing this and have the right motives and why they're doing this and, and, you know, and empower some other people who may not think it's for them. And every time we do the things that we do, um, I also think we, we give our community a seat at tables that we maybe wouldn't have been at before. Um, Shannon securing the fund, the DOD funding, which was amazing. We've had the honor at the end of code to be on the peer review board for the last two years for that funding. And our members have had to go toe to toe with physicians who wanted to discredit the patient voice. And we're so proud that Shannon made it able that we could be there and we could say, no, that's not right. And that's not going to serve our community well. And this is not what we should be doing. Um, so I think having organizations like ours that are fighting for the right things that have pure hearts and pure intentions that our community can trust is I think a game changer. Okay, I'm gonna add two, like two, my two cents to this too. I can't, I can't stop myself. So um, I, when I was working on this for this next film that's about to release, I talked to Greg Gonzalez. He runs the Global Policy Institute at Yale. And he was one of the founding members of ACT UP in the eighties and nineties, which were instrumental in getting HIV and AIDS funding. Um, and ask him like, you know, for a disease like endometriosis, what do we need to get this kind of large scale change? And he spoke to me and said he thought that they were similar in a lot of ways. Um, of course, not the disease pathologies or anything like that, but that, um, you know, it's a disease of a certain amount of taboo where it's been ignored and that people are suffering as a result. So, and I asked, you know, how did ACT, ACT UP mobilize to, you know, get this large amount of, you know, um, research funding and really change the narrative um, about this disease in, in a relatively short amount of time considering. And, you know, he was like, Shannon, this is what you have to do. You have to get a group of people who have the right intentions, the right goals that are not going to be, you know, um, distracted or motivated by other things, like not necessarily, for example, you know, pharmaceutical funding who maybe, uh, you know, their intentions may be a little compromised perhaps about, you know, the end goal, but also the most important thing is you all have different strengths and you're not all the same and you're all very different and you can all add something to the collective whole. And he's like, you only need like 10 people. He's like, we had 10 people. You had someone that's really good, you know, that understood this point of view. You had someone really understood research. You had someone that really understood the medical community. You understood uh, someone who really did really good, you know, PR and marketing. Uh, someone who, um, oh, goodness, who could be a liaison for a different industry. And, but then you brought them in a room together and they got along really well because they all had the same end goal. And that is to improve the lives of the patients. And I'm, I'm more hopeful than I've ever been that we can get to that point with all of the panelists here today and others in the community who are mobilizing, who are informed, who are well-intentioned and that feel that that fire to, to do something about it. And like Lauren said, we, we're not all the same. We don't need to be all the same. We all need to be different, uh, but have a collective goal. So I think the reality is, and I don't know if they have this setting on, um, but you can all put your hands up if we want to talk about patient groups. Um, how many of you had heard of excision before Nancy's Nook existed? And how many of you learned of excision through Nancy's Nook? Put your hand up in the, if they have that setting on, Yolanda, I don't know if you have that setting on. But if you, you know, if you, you know, Nancy had a tremendous impact because she was one patient who wanted better. And yes, yeah, she has other people that help her administer. And yes, yeah, she has her own personality, but because she created without giving up the fight, basically running 24 hours a day, this 100,000 person support group on Facebook for nothing. She gets no, no money, no nothing she created a culture that enabled all of us to go out and to ask for more from our community and to push forward. So the end, if you go to any of the surgical conferences where Nancy's is, it's very clear to see her impact because she's a celebrity, like a big surgeon just coming out of fellowship wants autographs from Nancy. And that's patient voice. I understand she was a nurse, but 
you know, it, it, the, the impact of a patient group, and she may not speak for everybody, but you can't deny her impact that we, many people who never would have heard of excision before have heard of it because of her. So the impact of patient groups are incredible. So e even, you know, endo co is the reason why we have the whole slogan one in 10. And look at what that did for all of us on, on, um, in social media, it gave us a rally cry, right? So, you know, and, and endo what exposed so many people, the film exposed so many people to what is endometriosis and what is the difference? She has a whole scene. You showed it yesterday. What is the difference between the two surgeries and how to, it made people connect to life with endometriosis. So like, and, and the endometriosis summit provides something different. I'm not talking about myself. So, and, and endo black speaks to a market that doesn't exist. There is, you know, Lauren said it right away. She went into the patient groups and she found no one that looked like her. And I know Les Henderson is not here, but Les Henderson could tell you there were even less people that look like less um, and she's endo queer. And so I think that these patient groups provide an outlet, but in an absence of real information in a market that is filled with myths and misconceptions, the crowdsourced information in terms of endometriosis is the, and for many, the best source of en information you're going to get. That's why we're patient and practitioner town meeting because there is no true education in endometriosis without there being a patient voice. Now, the other side of that is every influencer wants to make a buck off of this endometriosis crowd. And we have to have some unity that we're not here to profit off of. We're not here to be fed miss, more misinformation Avvi is already trying to control the market. We don't need more misinformation. And the patient groups that want to own the whole pie instead of this unity that we have here today, but the unity that we're creating, they want to own the whole pie for what reason? Because there's 200 million people sick worldwide. We need to help them all. It can't be about operating in our own bubble and stealing from this person and getting from that and what we're here to move the conversation forward. So patient groups have a huge role, but they also can have a negative role if they're providing more misinformation or if they're trying to be a hog while they're providing misinformation. So I, I mean, the patient voice I believe is the most important thing um, in endometriosis because no one else is listening. I think like Jenna could be, I've seen you somewhere talk about it. That's why I just point this out that um, you learned about like how to get care from everybody else. If we didn't have our own patient um, driven community, no one probably would know what thoracic endometriosis is. I work in hernia. No one would know if I were not so open and videoing my surgeries and showing this and showing that. No one would know that that's an associated condition with endometriosis. There's a question about pain, painful sex, which I can't wait to answer. So excited about that. But no one would, we can be honest with each other so that you're not alone while you struggle. And that's, you know, and, and it's becoming that if we weren't honest, nobody else is. And that's the value of the patient community. Sorry, I'm cooped up and I don't leave the house at all. I get very excited. Oh, we love to see it. I'm so inspired. And I think this was really amazing. Uh, just so because of time and wanting to sort of make sure that we have room for all of these amazing questions that have been popping up. I am going to move on to our last question. Um, which is just to wrap up our event, I want to give our amazing panelists the opportunity to share a quick message. So maybe a few sentences or just one sentence um, for anyone who's recently been diagnosed with endometriosis, or if you'd rather uh, for any physicians or future physicians watching who are going to be treating the condition. I can start. Uh, oh, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, if you've just recently uh, been diagnosed, I would say give yourself time because I think that the road to diagnosis is unfortunately so long and so difficult that 
many of us feel as though we're gonna feel better right away. And I think that there's so much that goes into becoming so sick that we need to give ourselves time to, to rebuild and to give ourselves to assemble a toolkit that will help us, um, like Jenna said, learn to thrive again. Um, so give yourself time and really pay attention, continue to pay attention to your body and always seek the answers and, and stay connected if, if you need support. I mean, we all have this common goal of supporting people around the world. So reach out and just give yourself time. And for physicians, I would say um, just to be empathetic and really listen and check any biases that you might have or limitations in your expertise and refer uh, to experts without wasting any more time. And um, yeah, just work collaboratively and, and don't resist patients. I, I feel like sometimes um, some doctors are extremely open and other doctors kind of just resist a patient who comes in with a clear idea of what they need um, because they're influencing treatment. And I've, I've gotten that in my own care as well, where doctors remind me that my PhD is not a medical degree and that I should, I should uh, just listen to them. But I think that it's really important to remain open and to remain empathetic. Amazing. Um, Jenna, do you want to go next? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was answering a DM. Um, to sure. patients, I would say be prepared to advocate like crazy for yourself. I think that a lot of patients are surprised at how um, difficult it is to get good care. And a lot of people, it's their first time encountering the healthcare system at all. Like I knew it was a mess because I've worked in it forever. So I was prepared to have to fight. And I don't think most patients are. I think that we have this kind of uh, belief that it's there to just serve us in all the best ways whenever we need it. And that for this disease, that's just not true. Um, and the way to, to be prepared is to research, to really know this disease, to be able to ask the right questions, to be able to know when to walk away from a physician that's not listening to you or giving you misinformation. And then for... Doctors, I would say if we could get to a place where you could admit and recognize that most of what you learned in, in, about endometriosis in med school was wrong, it would do us a lot of help uh, so that we could be all starting on the same page in that like there's a lot of outdated theories that you, you're still being taught. And maybe if we could check ego and put that aside and admit that for this disease, the patients do know a little bit more than a lot of the OBGYNs that they are seeing do, um, that would help as well because then we will get referred out more quickly to people who can handle our disease. Being okay to say, I don't know about something. I mean that to me, a, a doctor just telling me, I don't know, instead of explaining away or downplaying what I'm bringing to you because you don't have the expertise is, is so traumatic, number one, because it makes the patient doubt themselves and feel gaslit, uh, but it also delays care. So just checking ego, being okay with referring out and admitting that the medical community has, has failed, the endometriosis community would be really, really helpful. Thank you for that. Shannon, do you wanna go next? Sure. Uh, my advice to someone, I would say that first know that this is a very individual disease and what worked for someone else might not work for you. Um, and that's okay. Uh, and that, yes, you will just be prepared to really fight for yourself um, in a way that you maybe never have before. This is not a disease that you can go into a doctor's office and say, you know, cure me, as uh, someone said last night in the film. That's so true. Um, you really have to find the answers for yourselves. A lot of times patients in this disease end up knowing more than the doctors um, that they, you know, the regular local doctor, they may go in and talk about this disease. Um, and, and I've said this many times before, if I could tell not only a patient, but a healthcare provider, one thing, literally one thing to go do is that is to go join Nancy's Nook because Yes, I would love for, it'd be great for them to watch into what, they could learn a lot. They could join, you know, various social, um, um, 
support groups and follow different influencers on social media and all of those things. But if they, a patient joins Nancy's Nook, they're on the right path to getting really good fact-based advice from other women and practitioners. And I also think it's really important for healthcare providers to also join Nancy's Nook to understand the patient experience and understand how the healthcare profession has, is failing endometriosis patients. And I think that they can learn that by being a part of that group. Awesome, and we'll make sure that's definitely linked in our documents. Um, uh, Sally, I see you raising your hand, I'll let you go next. Right, I also think the newly diagnosed person with endometriosis needs to find their voice um, and because you're gonna have to use it like nothing else. And Shannon's right. What my endometriosis is not Shannon's endometriosis, is not Jenna's, Jenna's endometriosis, is not anybody else's endometriosis. And, but, and the treatments are going to have similarities, but they're gonna be different from person to person. And so I really advise that person to find their voice, to get educated, to come to the endometriosis summit, to join Nancy's Nook, to watch endo what, to read. Somebody mentioned there's a very good resource in the comments um, called Beating Endo, which is an excellent resource. Um, and, and to become educated. And yes, your family will sit there and go, you're crazy. You're just you know looking for answers. The doctor said, take the birth control pill. You hold your ground and you find your voice and you do what's best for you and don't doubt it. And if you do doubt it, then find one of us or find one of our communities and we will support you. So the other thing I'd like to say is that for the um, medical practitioners out there, um, we'd love to see you. If you need to be vetted, go to I Care Better and vet your skills because there's a mentorship process where you could develop better surgical skills. If you have access to it, we really want, Shannon can talk a little bit about the nurses kits that are geared to educate um, practitioners and teens um, that can make a huge difference um, in, in people's lives and in diagnosing early, the nurses kits are amazing. And, and um, if you are ready to learn more, have an open mind because what you learned in medical school in the 15 minutes they talk about endometriosis really isn't correct. And I'll tell you an interesting story just going on in my life. Unfortunately, right now, my mother is just coming out of the ICU with COVID. So we're over at, at the, she's COVID negative now, but we're over at the hospital every minute of our lives now that they let us back in. And I introduced myself, hi, I'm Sally Sorrell, I'm a physical therapist, because I need an in to these doctors. They're not gonna listen to me if I'm just like the kid sitting there. And they all say, what kind of therapy do you? I do pelvic physical therapy, but I specialize in endometriosis. I have had just from introducing myself, every single doctor ask me more, or I've had every therapist that walked in the room email me for more information. And so, people are beginning to realize that there is a drought of decent endometriosis education out there. And now as patients, it's sort of, we got to go in and disseminate the word. Now, does that mean the primary cares and the general surgeons are ready? No, not really. But maybe the gynecologists will start listening. Um, somebody asked for our Instagrams. I think all of our panelists, we could put it in the chat so we don't take up time with that. Perfect. Thank you for that. Yeah, they're also in the Google Doc that Yolanda shared. Um, Lauren, if you want to close off the panel with your um, words of wisdom, that would be great. And then I'll pass it over to Yolanda, who will take some uh, questions for the Q&A. Yes, thank you. Um, I do have a couple of things. Um, so I'm going to try to make it as short as possible. My three tips for people that um, have recently been diagnosed with endometriosis is to do your research, to journal and advocate for yourself. Journaling, it's very, very important for you to do that. A lot of times we don't think it's that important. We think it's a waste of time. However, when you are going to your gynecologist, your endo specialist, after journaling your information, it's easier for you to pull out your journal and share what your pain has been, what your symptoms have been, how long they've been bothering you, your other medications, because as we know, we have multiple medications, unfortunately, um, and you don't want them to interfere with 
with each other. You also want to be able to share um, what your food intake has been with your gynecologist or OBGYN or endospecialist. So I do encourage encourage everybody to journal, whether or not you want to put it in your notepad on your cell phone, or you want to get an actual journal or notebook to write that information in. I think that's beneficial. I think research is a real big priority. Dr. Sally, Shannon, Jenna, they've all said it. My endo is not your endo. So what I do for my body is not going to be the same thing you can do for your body. Nancy's Nooks is a great place to do your research. Um, you also have research and resources at Endo Summit, Endo What, um, the Endo Co, Endo Black. You also have them at Endo Queer, um, the Endo Educator. So you have a uh, uh a variety of resources at your fingertips for you to go on Facebook, for you to go on Instagram and look at these different resources so you can try to uh, do research. Now, we're not telling you to go on WebMD and diagnose yourself. We're just telling you to look up the information and you have to do research on your body as well. And that's where journaling comes in. Um, and lastly is advocating. Now, we're not telling you to become endo advocates, get on platforms and talk about it if you're uncomfortable. That is not what we're trying to encourage you to do. However, I do want you to understand that it's important for you to be an advocate when you are going to the doctor's office. If you feel uncomfortable, tell that doctor. And if you feel uncomfortable to tell that doctor at that moment you feel uncomfortable, there's email and there's surveys. Um, you know, Jenna, I think Jenna and April, Christina have shared this with me in the past that when you go to a doctor and they ask you for a survey or they give you a survey, please fill that survey out so that that doctor can know how they did or the hospital can know um, what your concerns are. And even if they did awesome, share that. That way that we can get more information about this doctor actually listens to me. This doctor actually cares. That way, women that have endometriosis or people that have endometriosis, endometriosis can go and do their research and go and actually go to that doctor. So those are my three tips, research, journal, and advocating for yourself. Um, and I do want to share with health uh, professionals that it's important for you to do your research on your patients as well. Be mindful that when you're going in um, and doing your research or talking to uh, patients that you understand that this may be a disorder from an African-American person or a woman of color or a Caucasian woman versus what other things. Um, there are certain things that happen. Sickle cell anemia is something that's more prevalent for African-American people versus um, somebody else from a different ethnicity. So you have to just be mindful of what certain things are. Um, look at that. Uh, make sure you do your research on your patients because we're doing our research on our um, health professionals or our gynecologists or our OBGYNs or endospecialists. So I think that you should try to take some time um, and do your research. And I try to write down some notes. Um, I also want to encourage um, everybody, medical professionals, as well as patients to get an endo tribe. If you are a doctor and you have other doctors that are familiar, Dr. Sally said it. She said there are doctors that are reaching out to her. That is something that you want to do as a doctor or a health professional. As someone that has endometriosis, getting a group of women or a group of people that you know that have endometriosis are helpful because as we know, sometimes our family, they don't want to talk about that. You know, it, it does get difficult for them to listen to. And it also gets irritating for us when you tell us to take our birth control or when you tell us to meditate or when you tell us that we're not eating healthy. We don't want to hear that. So it's best to find your circle, your endo tribe, so that you could communicate with. And those are just a few things that I want to share with you. Amazing. This has been such an informative conversation with such a wealth of knowledge and I think a really empowering message behind it all. So thank you to all of our amazing panelists. A uh, big round of applause virtually. And Yolanda, if you just want to go through um, questions, I know we are cutting it short, so no problem if people have to go. We also have that Google Doc to continue the conversation afterwards, and you can always engage with us on social media as well. So write your questions in the chat, or if you want to ask them out loud in the chat, just say, I have a question, and then we will uh, call on you to speak.
Thanks, Tori. Yeah, so if you want to just put your any question you may have in the chat and just write if you uh, want to say it out loud or not. Um, I just wanted to say one quick thing, if I can. Um, <laughs> sure. In the chat, that um, anyone who would like to send a, a nurse toolkit to someone for free, they can go to nursesnoendo.com and put in the information, and we will send a free copy of the film Endo What, um, an educational booklet, eight page booklet for a nurse, as well as a sample lesson plan and a school and a discussion guide. And the nurse receives three and a half CNE credits also for reviewing the materials. It's something we did in partnership with Northeastern University. So everyone here today can just go there. There's absolutely no cost and they can make sure that a nurse near them receives education about endometriosis. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shannon. That's so important. So there was a question further back in the chat about painful sex. Um, and I want to answer that, um, that there are three major ways that people have pain from sex with endometriosis. And then I have a little follow-up. So the first thing is that if you have rectovaginal endometriosis, if something fully penetrates you, it's banging against the deposit of endometriosis. And so that's extremely painful. And um, most people with endometriosis, it's also a telltale sign of endometriosis. Most, if not all, uh, most people do when they have endometriosis, that is um, one of the reasons why they have painful sex. Another reason why you could have painful sex with endometriosis is that you get a reactive response to the deposits of the disease and the inflammatory nature of the disease in that your pelvic floor spasms completely. So I know that you go to pee or you go to have, um, and, and you come and everything comes out, but we don't realize that regardless, um, your pelvis is filled with muscles. And so in the presence of endometriosis, many times those muscles spasm. So typically the rectovaginal pain is pain further back and the um, muscular floor is pain that's a little more shallow. The third sort of realm of um, painful sex is that sex has always been painful. I know for me, sex was painful um, the first time I had it to up until when I had excision, like my third excision. So, um, and that the brain recognizes that pain and then it creates a feedback loop to your pelvis that is filled with all sorts of things. In addition to trauma, it actually forces your um, pelvis to spasm. So you need to sometimes take some time to treat all of these causes of pain. Um, and that means the rectovaginal endometriosis may need to be excised. The pelvic floor spasms may need to be treated by a pelvic floor physical therapist that's actually good and not just someone that like your friend's cousin said that they're using. And then also um, you may need to treat those um, what we call central nervous system patterns as well. So there was a question about painful sex. I wanted to add to that. I will also say, if you really want to talk about painful sex, Monday night, the endometriosis summit is having a full hour on that with a physiatrist, a pelvic physical therapist, and an excision surgeon. That's it. Thank you so much, Sally. It was very informative. Um, were there any other questions that anyone wanted to ask? Okay, Jenna, there's a one. question about um, how to advocate during the medical insurance appeal process. Do you want to share some of what you did? Because I know you had a very, very long process. Yes, um, it was horrendously long. Yeah, so in preparation for my surgery that I knew was going to be considered an out of network surgery. I actually changed health insurance plans to a plan that had better out of network benefits. Um, so doing your research for your plans and what your benefits are is so important because I don't think most people know what they are and what your out of pocket maximum is um, to before you're um, going up to pay for your out of network care. It's really important to know all of that before you even start the process. So 
every plan is different. And that's why I say it's important to research because what my plan considers the most that I can spend on a network may not be the same for you. So knowing what those numbers are for you is so important. Um, and then attacking it as a plan. So if you know going into when you plan to have surgery that you have an out of network maximum that you have to meet that's $15,000, and uh, your plan renews in January and you're coming up on November, if you wait until after January to have your surgery, that out-of-pocket maximum restarts all over again. So planning strategically when to have your procedure based on where you are with your maximum numbers is really important. So then when it comes to the appeal process, um, their insurance companies are more than likely going to suggest that you try something else before you do the thing that you're trying to get them to pay for. So for me, it was Lupron, um, and it was seeing specific doctors that were local to my area that they claimed could treat my endometriosis. So um, I submitted a, what was called a gap expansion, which meant I was petitioning to my insurance to have them pay for my surgery that was out of network at an in-network rate. And so what that meant was I would be responsible for less money up front and uh, the physician that I was seeing for the surgery would be reimbursed at an in-network rate. And to do that, every insurance company has a process, but mine wanted um, a form filled out. And the surgeon that I was seeing was gracious enough to supply supplemental information for me to submit along with that appeal. So it was statistics on their success rates at their center. It was information on all the different types of endometriosis that they felt that I had, which was bowel and thoracic the statistics on those, how limited it is to be able to find um, a surgeon who can actually treat thoracic endometriosis. So we went in like, here's all the info. This is why this person needs a surgery. And then I also, on my end, I hate that I had to, but I did everything that I knew they would have asked me to do. I did all the drugs. Um, I saw all the doctors that they asked me just to check the boxes. Literally, that was the only reason why. And every single doctor that they said I should have seen told me 100% we don't treat this, this type of disease. We don't, this is outside of our expertise. So I was confident going in that, okay, I did all the things that they would have asked me to already do. There's no way they can deny this surgery, but they did anyway. Hopefully you would have better success in that stage. And I know there are a lot of people who have had success with the appeal process. So one, like I said, first starting by petitioning for it to be considered an in-network surgery. Um, I've seen a lot of people with success with that. And then two, um, if they deny it, you do have one more potential for an appeal. And if maybe your first round, you didn't submit as much information or as much convincing information, kind of pulling it back, looking at what you submitted the first time around, maybe getting even doctors to petition on your behalf. Like I had my cardiothoracic doctor, my pulmonologist all write letters on my behalf saying this patient really needs a surgery and this is really important that she goes to this specific place. So as many people on your care team, your pelvic PT, anyone that you're seeing that can say, this is important, this is ne medically necessary, um, is, is going to help your case and your appeal for your insurance. And I'll just say as a, as a lawyer, <laughs> document everything. Uh, write down every single phone conversation, write down the person's name, their employee number, whatever they will give you, the time, exactly what was discussed. Uh, I know it's going to be very tedious, but this is these are the things that make a big difference in having success. And when all else fails, get a lawyer to write a letter for you. Um, even if you can't retain one, get one, get someone to write a letter um, because an insurance company needs to know that you're not going to go away with, you know, a first or second denial that you're there, you've done your homework and you're serious. Um, and that actually can make a really big deal. Wouldn't you say, wouldn't you say Jenna? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Uh, what I learned through the whole legal process is that, you know, and I've seen on the end of submitting prior authorizations on my patient's behalf um, and the things that they've asked me for as a practitioner to justify why it shouldn't have been denied. It's usually not very much that they're asking me for to convince them the yes. They just bet on the fact that most people aren't going to do the, the follow-up work, whether it's the doctor's office that's just not going to deal with submitting the information or it's the patient that's not going to deal. So they, they bet on you not doing everything you can do to appeal this process. And so then when they are met with people that are willing to do it, they're kind of like, eh, this isn't worth the fight. And they give in a lot of the time. I th they, they bet on out of a thousand people, 
that they're going to deny that maybe five of them will fight them on it, if that. I also want to add, I've had patients who um, find a vetted ex excision specialist abroad because sometimes it's cheaper to go to Mexico or to Romania than to get it covered in the US. I've had um, people who say, you know, um, no Christmas presents, donate to this fund. And, and it may take you a long time to get what you need or to be creative about getting what you need to look at maybe the specialist that's not in your state, but a specialist that's um, in another state that might be a little cheaper that you might have to, and they've had, you know, that have connected to churches that have paid some of their travel expenses that have paid for to house them. And so I think like, never lose hope. I know um, my hernia surgery was extremely expensive because that, of course, when it's no bulge hernia is not covered by insurance either. And um, I had to save for that. And I what? And I know that not everybody is able to save for that. Some people live paycheck to paycheck, but even there were some weeks I only had ten dollars to put to it. And I I just um, kept my head down and kept going. I've seen plenty of patients um, travel, go abroad, get creative. And I know the Canadians. I don't know if anybody in the panel can share what it's like. Um, to have to travel for surgery within Canada because the Canadian system is totally different. Uh, yeah, I could add to that. Um, I'm from Quebec, so the Quebec laws are even different from other provinces. And for my, uh, we have universal health insurance, except uh, if we travel then, so I traveled to Ontario for my surgery and it wasn't covered. And like Jenna, I had to submit documentation to show that I had done every single possible line of treatment that was possible, but only a portion of it was covered in the end after I appealed. I know that different provinces are, are completely different. Some fertility treatments are covered in some provinces uh, and not in Quebec. So it, it, it differs a lot across Canada. Um, but uh, for example, um, there, I mean, it, it really depends on, on your insurance if you have private insurance on top of the regular Medicare that, uh, that is in your province. So I think there's a lot of differences across Canada. Great, thank you so much um, to all the panelists for sharing about that. I think um, just to not be too over time, there was one person that had asked to ask a question. So um, maybe they can, a panelist can just briefly answer their question. I think it was Bree Weaver or Bray Yeah. Weaver? Yeah, okay, awesome. I, um, thanks, first of all, for taking the time, but I had surgery a little over a year ago, and it was, thank God, um, successful so far, but I also got told that I possibly had needed to see, like, a urologist because I, they seemed to think that I had interstitial sciatus, I can't even pronounce it, but interstitial sciatus or something, something to do with the bladder pressure, so I was just wondering how much you feel that comes up with other people's, you know, like other, if anybody else here has gotten that feedback or if that's a common thing you guys are seeing pop up, because that is again, just another doctor they want me to go see. And my specialist was amazing and I would recommend him to anybody, but of course he's not a urologist. So, so, <laughs> so um, Bree, that's an excellent question. So um, interstitial cystitis or IC, or as we call it now, painful bladder syndrome is found in 60 to 80% of people with endometriosis. And there's actually a study written by Maurice Chung on the connection between interstitial cystitis and endometriosis. Interstitial cystitis means that the um, lining of the bladder is upregulated, inflamed, and so, in some cases um, is red, and in some cases has something called glomerulations, which are like a sort of like an ooziness to the ladder, blind, ladder um, lining. Not everybody has glomerulations. You're only going to see that in cases that are really, really bad. Interstitial cystitis can cause symptoms like um, frequency, urgency, like I gotta pee right now. It can cause um, burning, um, burning when you pee, but most, more, most patients with IC have burning down the legs. Um, it can cause constipation, it can cause diarrhea, it can cause painful sex. It certainly causes horrendous pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and it um, oftentimes is in some ways more difficult to deal with en than endometriosis but they do come together. So if you, have, if you have bladder endometriosis, 
then what I say is you may not have full-blown interstitial cystitis, but your bladder is upregulated and annoyed. And so sometimes the treatments for interstitial cystitis help you move you on the continuum towards total relief. So that can include a low acid diet, working with a pelvic floor therapist. Um, the endometriosis summit is going to talk about Botox in the lining of the bladder. Very few people need that. Um, and you, it, it can also mean pelvic floor therapy, and it can also mean um, something called installations within the bladder. But many, many people who have endometriosis also have interstitial cystitis. And um, if you look at the way the research is, that's actually a pretty good referral. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Thank you so much for responding, Sally. I think um, it's now uh, a bit over time, so we're gonna wrap it up, but just wanted to thank all the panelists and everyone that uh, came out today. Uh, it really means so much. And thank you to the panelists for sharing your stories, your experiences, your opinions. It's really so valued and I've learned so much. I feel so inspired and I'm sure that many other people here also feel the same way. So thank you so much. Awesome. And with that, we'll wrap up our event today. So everyone's social media is listed in the document and in the chat. So follow everyone. And if you enjoyed this event, make sure to follow Medical Her Story on all our social media to hear about more. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thanks for having us.